Sometimes as world builders, what we really need is someone to give us the highlights of what it means to build a world in a certain era of our world, like the Stone Age or the Bronze Age or the Medieval Era and so on. This gave me the idea for running this series, which I call an Era Defined. And in this series, I try to define succinctly each era in our world's history, and I try and cover what are the things that you should know about that era in order to build a fantasy world that has that era in its past, or a fantasy story that is set in that era. Today, I am covering part of the Neolithic Stone Age, the revolution of agriculture that led to the rise of society in our world. Welcome to an era defined on Just-in-Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. I'll be talking about resources, technology, economics, society, religion, and all the markers that make up the era of the Neolithic. Now, when I started this series, I thought that I would be able to do an era per episode. But the very first episode on the Paleolithic people, the hunter-gatherers, was a 39-minute monstrosity. And that was for a simple society. So, I'm now breaking these videos up into chunks. So this is the first video on the Neolithic, and in it I will cover the basics of the kind of houses these people lived in, what they wore, and what their economics are like. In the next episode, I will then address things like the developing societies and the religion and magical aspects that you could include into such a setting, this being fantasy world building after all. Just a short PSA on that, I am not an archaeologist, I'm not a historian, my degree is in mathematics, and I make my living as a computer programmer. So this is my opinion as a consumer of a lot of content out there, and if an expert says something and I contradict that expert, chances are the expert is correct and I am way off base. I am approaching these videos from the perspective of a fantasy world builder, not that of a historian. And speaking of fantasy world building, I do write fantasy novels, although they're not set in the Neolithic age of my world. They do, however, have some good reviews with people saying things like great pacing, fantastic world building, and so on. So if you want to support the channel and help me make these videos a little easier, you can buy my books at any of the big retailers. There is a link down below to my website where you can follow the links to, to whichever shop you would like to support. Okay, enough of that. Let's crack on. So first, let's just do a basic of what the climate is like during the Neolithic Revolution. So the actual Ice Age is largely behind us at this point. The Ice Age was the period when we had a lot of hunter-gatherer societies. It was the Paleolithic Stone Age. So people who use tools, but not people who farm. Now, this climate is somewhat interrupted by what is called the Younger Dryas, which does appear to have had an impact on the Northern Hemisphere and its development of farming, maybe even a positive impact by putting the people under immense pressure by rapid climate change of the onset of the Younger Dryas. But since the Southern Hemisphere was not nearly as affected as the Northern Hemisphere, and you did still develop farming in the Southern Hemisphere, I don't think that you per se need an event like the Younger Dryas in order to have a Neolithic revolution. Farming appears to have developed fairly naturally from people sowing seeds and then walking away and returning to harvest it to reach a point where they needed to look after these fields. Also, as the megafauna went extinct and as the climate changed and it became warmer and less ice-agey, 
people had more children and they needed to feed them. And without the megafauna to hunt, they needed a more steady supply of food. And so as a defense mechanism against all of this, they developed farming over time, starting with grain. Now, in our world, farming and associated technological advances happened at different speeds in different locations, with the Levant, the Mediterranean Fertile Crescent, being the first of the places where it developed, and it kind of spread out from there. It also developed in the Americas independently, with those hunter-gatherers leaving. And of course, it also spread down into Africa. But why did farming develop so unevenly? Why did technology develop so unevenly? It is my opinion that mostly this has got to do with trade. See, when you have a lot of people who live in a fairly compact area, you're going to have traders go from one village to another Taking goods, yes, and perhaps bringing much required resources like copper and tin, but also bringing ideas. So if you're sitting in your little village and you have an idea for how to improve farming and a trader comes along and he sees your idea, he takes it to the next village and the next one. And then somebody there makes an improvement on it and some trader brings that idea back to your village. And so ideas beget ideas. That is, for example, in my opinion, why the Islamic Golden Age coincided with a period when the Great Silk Road was at its most active, the overland trade route between Europe and the Far East, because traders would go across that entire length, picking up ideas from one Islamic city, carrying it to another, carrying it to another, carrying it to another, and then bringing back, you know, the enhanced ideas. Ideas don't live in vacuums. They breathe together. So the more interconnected your landmass is, and the more people who live on it and are trading ideas across it, the faster your technological development of something like agriculture will go. You know, somebody will figure out bronze and then it will spread throughout the whole landmass. Somebody will figure out how to use obsidian and suddenly glass will be traded up and down the whole length of the continent. But if you have less people living in a bigger area, it will consequently mean that ideas spread less and therefore develop more slowly. Okay, so we've spoken a little bit about the climate. But what did people actually eat during the agricultural revolution? Are we talking about things we would recognize like bread yet? Well, yes, but not immediately. At the beginning of the agricultural revolution, there will still be a lot of hunting. Um, most of your meat production will still come from hunting. The first thing that people will farm will be grains. And they will make from that probably some kind of flat bread. I doubt that yeast will be invented yet, so you won't have bread rising. But you will have flat bread. People also at this point, of course, <laughs> invented beer. It was a very weak beer, but it would have gotten you drunk if you consumed enough of it. And there is some evidence that potentially they used that beer in religious rituals of some kind. But beer is, in and of itself, of course, also a foodstuff. I mean, it does give you carbohydrates, and you can work on it. Naturally, there would also have been seafood at this point. So those communities who live close to the ocean would have continued to eat from the sea. And then, as more and more animals are domesticated, animal produce would have become a more staple diet. So it would start with things like sheep and goat, and then cattle would become a domesticated product. Pigs as well, although pigs have a kind of dicey um, relationship with domestication. So they've been domesticated twice. And the reason why is because 
pigs don't have a secondary product. So if you look at all other domesticated kind of food animals, they have secondary products. Sheep have wool, goats have milk, cattle have milk, chickens have eggs. So they have the meat product part of themselves, but they also offer you a secondary product. You're not just keeping the animal in order to slaughter him. Because it is a lot of energy to put into an animal that you literally just slaughter. And that is why I think pigs were late to the domestication party and why I think they were domesticated twice. Because when you have larger settlements, like in the Bronze Era, pigs do offer garbage disposal as a sort of secondary product. But when you don't have those large settlements, they don't offer you that much beyond just something to eat. Anyway, so mostly these people would have eaten grains and then they would have supplemented that with hunting and eventually sheep meat and goat meat and cattle would start replacing the hunting part of their diet. Now, in terms of shelter, this is where you start seeing villages emerging for the first time and where you start seeing people building shelter. So it would start with things like mud brick houses. The first houses in our world are in what archaeologists call tells. And what seems to have been the building structure here is you would build your house. And then every now and again, perhaps once a generation, that house would be burnt and you would build and your son would build a house on top of your old house. And so the tell would be built layer by layer upwards, generation by generation in a place. And in Europe, those tells rise quite high. But in the Middle East, the Levant, where this kind of construction started before it spread into Europe, those tells can be like substantial hills, you know, 50 odd generations having built on top of one another that you're literally living on the remains of your ancestral house generation by generation. Now, in Europe, that tell building was eventually replaced by the LBK longhouses. The LBK longhouses were built close to rivers. They were built close to the uh, shore of a river. And it's pretty clear that they were a patrilocal culture. That is to say, the eldest son, generally speaking, would have inherited the parent's longhouse. And then low status males and women would move around. So women would marry outside of their community and go to another LBK site. And low status males would migrate away from their parents' village and establish a new village, you know, further up the river. Of course, what it looks like happened is eventually the river space kind of filled up and that started leading to conflict and war among these longhouse people. All of the villages of the Neolithic were built super compactly, whether they're longhouses or the tells or any other kind of village. They would be built back to back with your neighbor's wall being your wall, and they would be tightly constructed. There wouldn't at this point be much of a concept of streets. The invention of the wheel came somewhat later after the villages were constructed. So there wouldn't be much of a need for anything beyond kind of maybe a corridor or two between you and your neighbor's house. And these villages would have started out quite small. So, you know, they would have been quite compactly built. So you have these kind of tightly constructed initial villages that people would have stayed in, built out of mud bricks or built out of stones without mortar or built out of logs in the longhouse style. But no discussion of building in the Neolithic is complete without talking about monoliths.
So I did speak in the hunter-gatherer video about Gobekli Tepe and the construction of the monoliths there. But Gobekli Tepe, though it is the oldest site we found, appears to have only been the first of the monolithic buildings that were constructed starting in the very late hunter-gatherer period and continuing on into the Neolithic agricultural revolution. Now, there are a number of megalithic structure types. You get the single stone menors or monoliths, as well as the capstones that appear to be horizontal stones laid over a burial tomb. But you also get the multi-stone constructions, like the hinges, you know, the circular structures, or the alignment stones, where stones have been placed in alignment to each other to form spirals and so on, like the Karnak stones in Brittany, France. One of the most interesting structures, from my point of view, are the passage tombs. Now, these were constructed apparently sort of as tombs, but also as something else. There's not enough people buried here that it was common practice to bury people, but there are some people buried in them. So either these were the elites getting buried here or there was some other purpose. But the really interesting thing about the passage tomb is the fact that on the solstice, it shines the sun into the passage, like, and only on the solstices. So it's very clearly to do with telling the seasons that they built these passage tombs. And if you think about how important it would have been to farmers to know when the seasons are turning, you can understand why they wanted these permanent monument structures to help them understand that. Also, it could very well have been part of worship of the sun or worship of the earth in some way, or a way to entreat the sun perhaps to return each year, or some kind of religious significance around that turning of the season. And then the last part of the basics is, of course, what did these people wear? So they would have worn leather, naturally, and furs, but they also now, after the domestication of sheep, they have access to wool. And the first spindles, the drop spindle, was invented during this Neolithic period. In fact, the first loom with which you can then weave your thread that you've gotten from wool was invented 7,000 years ago. So you could very easily have had men and women wearing woven clothing at so far as 7,000 years ago. Bear in mind that it's probably not pants. Pants were only invented 4,000 years ago. So it would be loincloths or wraps or some kind of kilt skirt device, things like that. It's highly unlikely to be pants until way later in the process. You would also definitely have had decorations on your clothing. There's been one shirt type garment found that was absolutely covered with beads made from ostrich egg cell. And if I think about the amount of work that it would have taken to create those many beads, drill tiny little holes in them with stone age tools and attach them to that shirt type device, that the person who was buried with that ostrich cell shirt must have been an incredibly high status individual to have a shirt with that much decoration, which was then placed in their grave as a grave good to take to the next world. You would start having gems, you would start having gemstones and jewelry during this period, but that absolute explosion would have to wait until we had enough control over fire in order to have metalworking, proper metalworking. At this point, while people could have cold worked with copper and with gold and with other metals, 
they wouldn't yet be able to smelt those metals. So they might heat them up to make it a bit easier to work with them, but they're definitely not at the point where they're creating the magnificent kind of jewelry and so on that we see during the Bronze Age. And if you enjoyed that discussion of the basics of Neolithic life, hit the thumbs up button and let's talk about their economy. So first, the resources of these people. Farmland becomes your most critical resource here. Do you have access to farmland? Is it yours? Defending it becomes a critical part of your life here. But besides farmland, you're also starting to have clay be a serious resource. Because during the Neolithic Revolution, the pottery wheel is invented. And that is why we speak about the pre-pottery Neolithic and the pottery Neolithic. Because once they invented the pottery wheel, the pottery exploded as a means of creating vessels to keep your grain in, vessels to keep your food in, vessels to carry water in. You just had pottery upon pottery upon pottery. But until you have the wheel, it is quite hard to make pottery containers. So once you have that, you definitely clay is a big part of your resource value. It is still the Stone Age, so flint and obsidian are still primary resources that you make tools with. But copper that you work cold will start becoming a resource here as people slowly start developing that thought around working with metals and smelting metals. They're not there yet, but they are working towards it. Of course, domesticated animals are becoming a resource now as well, starting with your sheep and your goat and your cattle, and then horses coming later, your llamas, camels, those kinds of transportation animals. Even smaller animals like bunnies, chickens, and guinea pigs would start being domesticated at this point and being kept as food sources. Speaking of domestication, let's talk about agricultural technology development and strategies. So agriculture probably started as the slash and burn technique. So slash and burn is pretty much what it sounds like. You slash woodlands and woody plants until you, you know, have them all sitting there on the land. You let that dry out. You set fire to it. And then that forms a nutrient-rich ash soil into which you then plant your seeds. In about three to five years, that field starts losing its nutrient-rich elements and you move on to another plot of land. Now, that obviously <laughs> means that you are leaving in your wake completely worked out fields. And it takes these fields anything from five years to 20 years, depending on their location, to recover until they can once again be subject to slash and burn farming. So the invention of the plow and um, using oxen to pull the plow made farming move away from that slash and burn technique. Because now you could take manure and you could work it into the land, which then makes the land much more fertile. And using the plow rather than slash and burn, you can turn, you can till the soil and bring up new soil and keep your land much more active. So you would definitely have seen the invention of the plow somewhere towards the middle of the agricultural revolution. It would have been made of wood at this point, And at first it would have been pushed by a human. And then as they domesticate oxen and horses, those animals would become part of the farming process of pulling the plow, which is obviously a lot more efficient than a human pushing it. And about 5,000 years ago, irrigation was used for the first time in Mesopotamia, which is pretty much where Iraq is now. 
So irrigation was used as, as long ago as 5,000 years. Canals were dug, water were run to the fields, and that water was distributed over the fields in order to make farming viable even when rainfall started being irregular. Of course, we must also talk about labor. You do start seeing specialization of labor at this point. You will have craftspeople who do things like make jewelry or make pottery or make baskets and make clothes and so on, maybe even weavers and spinners. And then you have the general population who grow the food in the fields. And you start seeing the emergence of the elite who do not work, primarily at this point in the religious class. We will talk much more about that kind of structure when we talk about the societies of the Neolithic peoples. But for right now in the economic discussion, you should consider that your labor is definitely starting to become more specialized at this point. You will also start seeing the emergence of a merchant class who take goods between various sedentary settlements and who bring resources from far-lying areas to higher populated areas and travel between these settlements. And then, of course, a large part of the discussion around economics is about the technologies that are developed during this period. So I spoke about the pottery wheel and the wheel would then be attached to a sled, which would mean your transportation becomes easier. And then once you figure out how to get a horse attached to the cart, you have a vehicle that is pulled by an animal. And then I think you will really have a merchant class becoming a true reality. We spoke about the drop spindles and the hand looms which are being invented during this time. Of course, you still do have the stone tools, as I said, stone axes and stone bow and arrows and all of those kinds of um, equipment is still with you, especially your war equipment is still very much stone tools at this point. And then, of course, all of the farming equipment that you need, things like plows and drills and spades and digging sticks, you know, all of those kinds of um, pieces of equipment will start being developed during this period, especially as people become sedentary and they can now stockpile tools. And of course, in order to work with the grains and so on, you would need to start having, you know, those mortar and pestle type things with which you can grind grains together and crack them open. So you would definitely start seeing your early kind of grindstone materials and things that will later on develop into flour molds and so on. Your economic models at this point is probably still barter. I don't know that you would have a currency this early. You might start seeing the beginnings of a currency, but I think proper currency will probably only come with the additional complexity of the trade of the Bronze Age, perhaps in the late Neolithic you might start seeing the beginnings of currency begin to be a reality. And if you enjoyed that discussion about economics, hit the thumbs up button. And that is all that I have time for in this video. For the next one, I will discuss societal organizations and all the rest of the elements that make up the Neolithic. If you want to support this channel directly, hit the join button. And if you would like to have something for your return, don't forget I do have those books available and all of that does help me make more and better videos. And if you enjoyed this video, maybe check out my video on technology levels in fantasy worlds. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds.